Welcome back to the channel, Legendary Legacy, Audiobook Free Daily, a channel that shares the audio recap and full audiobook of the legendary best-selling books of all time without spending a penny. Today, we will continue with the book, Atomic Habits, An Easy and Proven Way to Build Good Habits and Break Bad Ones by James Clear. This is a book that shows you how to make small changes in your habits that can lead to big results in your life. You will learn how to create good habits, break bad ones, and master the tiny behaviors that shape your destiny. We will finish with Episode 10 and Epilogue, Conclusion, The Secret to Results That Last. Listen to the recap audiobook episodes of the channel, which are published on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and other podcast platforms. You can tell us more information about any book you would like us to have an audiobook about, please leave your book info below in the video comments, new audiobook episodes are published daily and recap. Books are published on Sundays every week. If you find this content useful, please support our channel by liking, commenting on the video, following, subscribing, and sharing this content with your friends and relatives so that we have more motivation to produce more audiobook episodes with the best and latest quality. Thank you for listening and have a nice day. Conclusion, The Secret to Results That Last There is an ancient Greek parable known as the Sorites Paradox, which talks about the effect one small action can have when repeated enough times. One formulation of the paradox goes as follows, can one coin make a person rich? If you give a person a pile of ten coins, you wouldn't claim that he or she is rich. But what if you add another? And another? And another? At some point? Point, you will have to admit that no one can be rich unless one coin can make him or her so. We can say the same about atomic habits. Can one tiny change transform your life? It's unlikely you would say so. But what if you made another? And another? And another? At some point, you will have to admit that your life was transformed by one small change. The holy grail of habit change is not a single 1% improvement, but a thousand of them. It's a bunch of atomic habits stacking up, each one a fundamental unit of the overall system. In the beginning, small improvements can often seem meaningless because they get washed away by the weight of the system. Just as one coin won't make you rich, one positive change like meditating for one minute or reading one page each day is unlikely to deliver a noticeable difference. Gradually, though, as you continue to layer small changes on top of one another, the scales of life start to move. Each improvement is like adding a grain of sand to the positive side of the scale, slowly tilting things in your favor. Eventually, if you stick with it, you hit a tipping point. Suddenly, it feels easier to stick with good habits. The weight of the system is working for you rather than against you. Over the course of this book, we've looked at dozens of stories about top performers. We've heard about Olympic gold medalists, award-winning artists, business leaders, life-saving physicians, and star comedians who have all used the science of small habits to master their craft and vault to the top of their field. Each of the people, teams, and companies we have covered has faced different circumstances, but ultimately progressed in the same way, through a commitment to tiny, sustainable, unrelenting improvements. Success is not a goal to reach or a finish line to cross. It is a system to improve, an endless process to refine. In Chapter 1, I said, if you're having trouble changing your habits, the problem isn't you. The problem is your system. Bad habits repeat themselves again and again not because you don't want to change, but because you have the wrong system for change. As this book draws to a close, I hope the opposite is true. With the four laws of behavior change, you have a set of tools and strategies that you can use to build better systems and shape better habits. Sometimes a habit will be hard to remember and you'll need to make it obvious. Other times you won't feel like starting and you'll need to make it attractive. In many cases, you may find that a habit will be too difficult and you'll need to make it easy. And sometimes, you won't feel like sticking with it and you'll need to make it satisfying. 
Behaviors are effortless here. Obvious, attractive, easy, satisfying. Behaviors are difficult here. Invisible, unattractive, hard, unsatisfying. You want to push your good habits toward the left side of the spectrum by making them obvious, attractive, easy, and satisfying. Meanwhile, you want to cluster your bad habits toward the right side by making them invisible, unattractive, hard, and unsatisfying. This is a continuous process. There is no finish line. There is no permanent solution. Whenever you're looking to improve, you can rotate through the four laws of behavior change until you find the next bottleneck. Make it obvious. Make it attractive. Make it easy. Make it satisfying. Round and round. Always looking for the next way to get 1% better. The secret to getting results that last is to never stop making improvements. It's remarkable what you can build if you just don't. Stop. It's remarkable the business you can build if you don't stop working. It's remarkable the body you can build if you don't stop training. It's remarkable the knowledge you can build if you don't stop learning. It's remarkable the fortune you can build if you don't stop saving. It's remarkable the friendships you can build if you don't stop caring. Small habits don't add up. They compound. That's the power of atomic habits. Tiny changes. Remarkable results. Appendix. What should you read next? Thank you so much for taking the time to read this book. It has been a pleasure sharing my work with you. If you are looking for something to read next, allow me to offer a suggestion. If you enjoyed Atomic Habits, then you may like my other writing as well. My latest articles are sent out in my free weekly newsletter. Subscribers are also the first to hear about my newest books and projects. Finally, in addition to my own work, each year I send out a reading list of my favorite books from other authors on a wide range of subjects. Little Lessons from the Four Laws In this book, I have introduced a four-step model for human behavior, cue, craving, response, reward. This framework not only teaches us how to create new habits but also reveals some interesting insights about human behavior. Problem Phase 1. Q 2. Craving Solution Phase 3. Response 4. Reward In this section, I have compiled some lessons, and a few bits of common sense, that are confirmed by the model. The purpose of these examples is to clarify just how useful and wide-ranging this framework is when describing human behavior. Once you understand the model, you'll see examples of it everywhere. Awareness comes before desire. A craving is created when you assign meaning to a cue. Your brain constructs an emotion or feeling to describe your current situation, and that means a craving can only occur after you have noticed an opportunity. Happiness is simply the absence of desire. When you observe a cue, but do not desire to change your state, you are content with the current situation. Happiness is not about the achievement of pleasure, which is joy or satisfaction, but about the lack of desire. It arrives when you have no urge to feel differently. Happiness is the state you enter when you no longer want to change your state. However, Happiness is fleeting because a new desire always comes along. As Cod Budris says, happiness is the space between one desire being fulfilled and a new desire forming. Likewise, suffering is the space between craving a change in state and getting it. It is the idea of pleasure that we chase. We seek the image of pleasure that we generate in our minds. At the time of action, we do not know what it will be like to attain that image, or even if it will satisfy us. The feeling of satisfaction only comes afterward. This is what the Austrian neurologist Viktor Frankl meant when he said that happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue. Desire is pursued. Pleasure ensues from action. Peace occurs when you don't turn your observations into problems. 
The first step in any behavior is observation. You notice a cue, a bit of information, an event. If you do not desire to act on what you observe, then you are at peace. Craving is about wanting to fix everything. Observation without craving is the realization that you do not need to fix anything. Your desires are not running rampant. You do not crave a change in state. Your mind does not generate a problem for you to solve. You're simply observing and existing. With a big enough why you can overcome any how. Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher and poet, famously wrote, He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. This phrase harbors an important truth about human behavior. If your motivation and desire are great enough, that is, why are you are acting, you'll take action even when it is quite difficult. Great craving can power great action, even when friction is high. Being curious is better than being smart. Being motivated and curious counts for more than being smart because it leads to action. Being smart will never deliver results on its own because it doesn't get you to act. It is desire, not intelligence, that prompts behavior. As Naval Ravikant says, the trick to doing anything is first cultivating a desire for it. Emotions drive behavior. Every decision is an emotional decision at some level. Whatever your logical reasons are for taking action, you only feel compelled to act on them because of emotion. In fact, people with damage to emotional centers of the brain can list many reasons for taking action but still will not act because they do not. Have emotions to drive them. This is why craving comes before response. The feeling comes first, and then the behavior. We can only be rational and logical after we have been emotional. The primary mode of the brain is to feel, the secondary mode is to think. Our first response, the fast, non-conscious portion of the brain, is optimized for feeling and anticipating. Our second response, the slow, conscious portion of the brain, is the part that does the thinking. Psychologists refer to this as System 1, feelings and rapid judgments, versus System 2, rational analysis. The feeling comes first, System 1, the rationality only intervenes later, System 2. This works great when the two are aligned, but it results in illogical and emotional thinking when they are not. Your response tends to follow your emotions. Our thoughts and actions are rooted in what we find attractive, not necessarily in what is logical. Two people can notice the same set of facts and respond very differently because they run those facts through their unique emotional filter. This is one reason why appealing to emotion is typically more powerful than appealing to reason. If a topic makes someone feel emotional, they will rarely be interested in the data. This is why emotions can be such a threat to wise decision making. Put another way, most people believe that the reasonable response is the one that benefits them, the one that satisfies their desires. To approach a situation from a more neutral emotional position allows you to base your response on the data rather than the emotion. Suffering drives progress. The source of all suffering is the desire for a change in state. This is also the source of all progress. The desire to change your state is what powers you to take action. It is wanting more that pushes humanity to seek improvements, develop new technologies, and reach for a higher level. With craving, we are dissatisfied but driven. Without craving, we are satisfied but lack ambition. Your actions reveal how badly you want something. If you keep saying something is a priority but you never act on it, then you don't really want it. It's time to have an honest conversation with yourself. Your actions reveal your true motivations. Reward is on the other side of sacrifice. Response, sacrifice of energy, always precedes reward, the collection of resources. The runner's high only comes after the hard run. The reward only comes after the energy is spent. Self-control is difficult because it is not satisfying. A reward is an outcome that satisfies your craving. 
This makes self-control ineffective because inhibiting our desires does not usually resolve them. Resisting temptation does not satisfy your craving, it just ignores it. It creates space for the craving to pass. Self-control requires you to release a desire rather than satisfy it. Our expectations determine our satisfaction. The gap between our cravings and our rewards determines how satisfied we feel after taking action. If the mismatch between expectations and outcomes is positive, surprise and delight, then we are more likely to repeat a behavior in the future. If the mismatch is negative, disappointment and frustration, then we are less likely to do so. For example, if you expect to get $10 and get $100, you feel great. If you expect to get $100 and get $10, you feel disappointed. Your expectation changes your satisfaction. An average experience preceded by high expectations is a disappointment. An average experience preceded by low expectations is a delight. When liking and wanting are approximately the same, you feel satisfied. Satisfaction equals liking, wanting. This is the wisdom behind Seneca's famous quote, being poor is not having too little, it is wanting more. If your wants outpace your likes, you'll always be unsatisfied. You're perpetually putting more weight on the problem than the solution. Happiness is relative. When I first began sharing my writing publicly it took me three months to get 1,000 subscribers. When I hit that milestone, I told my parents and my girlfriend. We celebrated. I felt excited and motivated. A few years later, I realized that 1,000 people were signing up each day. And yet I didn't even think to tell anyone. It felt normal. I was getting results 90 times faster than before but experiencing little pleasure over it. It wasn't until a few days later that I realized how absurd it was that I wasn't celebrating something that would have seemed like a pipe dream just a few years before. The pain of failure correlates to the height of expectation. When desire is high, it hurts to not like the outcome. Failing to attain something you want hurts more than failing to attain something you didn't think much about in the first place. This is why people say, I don't want to get my hopes up. Feelings come both before and after the behavior. Before acting, there is a feeling that motivates you to act, the craving. After acting, there is a feeling that teaches you to repeat the action in the future, the reward. Cue a craving, feeling, response, reward, feeling. How we feel influences how we act, and how we act influences how we feel. Desire initiates. Pleasure sustains. Wanting and liking are the two drivers of behavior. If it's not desirable, you have no reason to do it. Desire and craving are what initiate a behavior. But if it's not enjoyable, you have no reason to repeat it. Pleasure and satisfaction are what sustain a behavior. Feeling motivated gets you to act. Feeling successful gets you to repeat. Hope declines with experience and is replaced by acceptance. The first time an opportunity arises, there is hope of what could be. Your expectation, cravings, is based solely on promise. The second time around, your expectation is grounded in reality. You begin to understand how the process works and your hope is gradually traded for a more accurate prediction and acceptance of the likely outcome. This is one reason why we continually grasp for the latest get-rich-quick or weight-loss scheme. New plans offer hope because we don't have any experiences to ground our expectations. New strategies seem more appealing than old ones because they can have unbounded hope. As Aristotle noted, youth is easily deceived because it is quick to hope. Perhaps this can be revised to, youth is easily deceived because it only hopes. There is no experience to root the expectation in. In the beginning, hope is all you have. How to apply these ideas to business. Over the years, I've spoken at Fortune 500 companies and growing startups about how to apply the science of small habits to run more effective businesses and build better products. I've compiled many of the most practical strategies into a short bonus chapter. 
I think you'll find it to be an incredibly useful addition to the main ideas mentioned in Atomic Habits. How to apply these ideas to parenting. One of the most common questions I hear from readers is something along the lines of, how can I get my kids to do this stuff? The ideas in Atomic Habits are intended to apply broadly to broadly to all of human behavior, teenagers are humans, too, which means you should find plenty of useful strategies in the main text. That said, parenting does face its own set of challenges. As a bonus chapter, I've put together a brief guide on how to apply these ideas specifically to parenting. Acknowledgements I have relied heavily on others during the creation of this book. Before anyone else, I must thank my wife, Christy, who has been indispensable throughout this process. She has played every role a person can play in the writing of a book, spouse, friend, fan, critic, editor, researcher, therapist. It is no exaggeration to say this book would not be the same without her. It might not exist at all. Like everything in our life, we did it together. Second, I am grateful to my family not only for their support and encouragement on this book but also for believing in me no matter what project I happen to be working on. I have benefited from many years of support from my parents, grandparents, and siblings. In particular, I want my mom and dad to know that I love them. It is a special feeling to know that your parents are your greatest fans. Third, to my assistant, Lindsay Knuckles. At this point, her job defies description as she has been asked to do nearly everything one could imagine for a small business. Thankfully, her skills and talents are more powerful than my questionable management style. Some sections of this book are as much hers as they are mine. I am deeply grateful for her help. As for the content and writing of the book, I have a long list of people to thank. To start, there are a few people from whom I have learned so much that it would be a crime to not mention them by name. Leo Babata, Charles Duig, Nire Yao, and BJ Fogg have each influenced my thoughts on habits in meaningful ways. Their work and ideas can be found sprinkled throughout this text. If you enjoyed this book, I'd encourage you to read their writing as well. At various stages of writing, I benefited from the guidance of many fine editors. Thanks to Peter Guzzardi for walking me through the early stages of the writing process and for a kick in the pants when I really needed it. I am indebted to Blake Atwood and Robin Delabo for transforming my ugly and insanely long first drafts into a tight, readable manuscript. And I am thankful to Anne Barngrover for her ability to add a little class and poetic style to my writing. I'd like to thank the many people who read early versions of the manuscript, including Bruce Ammons, Darcy Ansel, Tim Ballard, Vishal Bardwaj, Charlotte Blank, Jerome Burt, Sim Campbell, Alabama Carlos, Nikki Case, Julie Chong, Jason Collins, Deborah Croy, Roger Dooley, Tiago Forte, Matt Gartland, Andrew Gearer, Randy Giffen, John Giganti, Adam Gilbert, Stefan Guyanet, Jeremy Hendon, Jane Horvath, Joachim Jansen, Josh Kaufman, and Kavanaugh, Chris Klaus, Zeke Lopez, Katie Macon, Sid Madsen, Kira McGrath, Amy Mitchell, Anna Moise, Stacey Morris, Tara Nicole Nelson, Taylor Pearson, Max Shank, Trey Shelton, Jason Shen, Jacob Zangelitis, and Ari Zelmano. The book benefited greatly from your feedback. To the team at Avery and Penguin Random House who made this book a reality, thank you. I owe a debt of special thanks to my publisher, Megan Newman, for her endless patience as I continually pushed back deadlines. She gave me the space I needed to create a book I was proud of and championed my ideas at every step. To Nina, for her ability to transform my writing while still retaining my original message. To Lindsay, Farron, Casey, and the rest of the PRH team for spreading the message of this book to more people than I could ever reach on my own. To Pete Garceau, for designing a beautiful cover for this book. And to my agent, Lisa Demona, for her guidance and insight at every step of the publishing process. To the many friends and family members who asked how's the book going, and offered a word of encouragement when I inevitably replied, slowly, 
thank you. Every author faces a few dark moments when writing a book, and one kind word can be enough to get you to show up again the next day. And finally, to you. Life is short and you have shared some of your precious time with me by reading this book. Thank you. May 2018 I hope you enjoyed this book. You can listen to the recap audiobook episodes of the channel, which are published on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and other podcast platforms. You can search for our channel by typing Legendary Legacy Audiobook Recap into the search bar. New audiobook episodes are published daily and recap books are published on Sundays every week. If you find this content useful, please support our channel by liking, commenting on the video, following, subscribing, and sharing this content with your friends and relatives so that we have more motivation to produce more audiobook episodes with the best and latest quality. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.